We open today's tale with Ilmarinen, the smith god of Finnish mythology, being blown across the night sky by the wind. He hadn't intended this, mind you. Rather, he had fallen victim to a very simple plot. I mean, could have happened to anyone, really. You see, the wind had plucked him up from the top of a tree planted by his wizard brother, Vinamonen, which was so tall that you could collect actual stars from the sky. Vinamonen had lured his brother to this treetop with the promise that he could collect the aforementioned starlight, and that's where he sprung his wind trap. For he needed Ilmarinen to settle a debt for him in the northern lands of Bohoya, where the winds would send him. Because it turned out when the wizard himself had been up north in search of a wife, he got captured by the evil witch Lolhi, who was looking for someone to build her the legendary Sampo. Unfortunately, Vinamonen was no smith, but his brother was. So the wizard promised that if he was freed, he would send Ilmarinen to complete the task. To sweeten the pot, Lauhi offered a marriage between her beautiful daughter, the Rainbow Maiden, to whomever could build the Sampo, and then she let Vinamonen go to fetch his smith brother by any means necessary. And since Ilmarinen wasn't interested in his brother's tall tales of beautiful shiny maidens, turns out the any means necessary was in fact a super tall tree magic wind trap. Like I said, simple plot. Who hasn't had that happen to them? But to Ilmarinen, the oddest thing in this entire tale was the Sampo itself. Because even the greatest smith the world had ever known had no idea what it was. The forging of today's historical tale was made possible by our creator-owned and operated streaming service Nebula. But more on that after the myth. Upon landing in Bohoyua, the Grand Smith Ilmarinen was greeted immediately by the toothless witch Lohi, who got straight to the point. Would he build the legendary Sampo for her? Now, Ilmarinen wasn't in the mood. He'd been duped into coming here after all, and wasn't about to start smithing right when he landed. But as he opened his mouth to tell her this, his stomach betrayed him with the most terrible growl. Come inside, the witch offered, and I'll make you the most wonderful meal. And as he looked at the horizon, realizing just how ridiculously far from home he was, he really didn't relish the idea of a trip back on an empty stomach, so he agreed. Lohi offered him a seat and procured him some of the most delightful vittles. Honestly, it was a bit more hospitality than he had expected from the evil witch of the north. Hm, go figure. Then when he was done, just as he was about to leave for his long trip south, that's when he saw her, the Rainbow Maiden. Wait, was his brother telling the truth? Of a voom. She was every bit as beautiful as his brother had described, and then some. And in an instant, Ilmarinen was lovestruck. And as the Rainbow Maiden approached the table, he quickly turned to the witch and asked, just to be sure, if this maiden was single. With a wide grin, Lauhi then explained that her daughter was very much single, and it just so happened that her bride price was, oh, would you look at that, the Sampo. Oh, what a deal! He could marry the most beautiful woman alive, and all he had to do was just invent the mythical Sampo. All right, look, not to brag or anything, but Ilmarinen had forged the actual Arch of Heaven. So, like, how hard could this Sampo be, really? He just needed to know one little detail before he could get started. Where was the workshop? Of course, there wasn't one. So immediately, he set to building one from the very earth with a set of bellows so large that it took four of Lauhi's minions just to pump them. Then, with the workshop completed, it was time to get down to the actual hard work. What in the world was a Sampo? Well, he thought, if no one knew what the Sampo was, he couldn't really get it wrong, could he? So on the first day of smithing, Ilmarinen pulled from the forge a magical bow. It was possibly the most wonderful bow that had ever been made, but as he carried it to present it to Lauhi and the Rainbow Maiden, he discovered it also had some pretty serious bloodlust. So he zipped straight back to the forge and threw the evil bow back into the fire. On the second day, Ilmarinen pulled a great ship from the fire. It too was a beautiful sight, but again, it was evil, having no desires except to rush into battle. So once again, Ilmarinen broke the pieces apart and cast them back into the flames. On the third day, a gilded cow emerged. Ilmarinen placed it as a gift in the witch's barn and began to search for the Rainbow Maiden. But before he could reach her, the cow escaped and pranced all through the forests and swamps. And to add insult to injury, the cow would not provide milk. To be very clear here, it's not that it couldn't provide milk. Rather, it chose to simply splash it around defiantly on the ground. So back into the fires it went. Okay, day four. He would try something different. How bad could a magical plow be? Oh, very, apparently. Okay. Because when he unleashed it into the fields, this too was a menace, wanting only to destroy all manner of crop. 
So doing his best Frodo impression he had been practicing all week, El Marinen cast it back into the fires from whence it came. Okay, so four evil items. El Marinen was stumped. He was the greatest smith of all, so what the heck was going on? The chimney was good, the bellows were strong, and you can't really go wrong with a big rock. So what was making everything so evil? Suspiciously, he began to eye his helpers. With a stern command, he had the men leave, and in their place, he summoned the four winds themselves to fan the flames. For three more days, the winds blew into the forge, until finally, Ilmarinen pulled out a different form. A golden hand mill with a rainbow lid. On three sides of the mill were large spouts, each of which created something different. From one side, it made flour. From another, salt. And from the third, it spewed. Gold coins? <laughs> Marvelous! But Ilmarinen refused to get too excited too quickly. Just what horrible purpose could this mill serve? So he waited. But when night came and went, despite all his workings, the mill was surprisingly fine. The gold didn't melt, the flour was pure, and the salt wasn't magically turning into ash or anything. But most importantly, there was no desire from the Sampo for death. Nailed it. If there ever was a Sampo, this had to be it. It was a veritable horn of plenty. No, scratch that, it was better. Because the Sampo even makes gold. <laughs> Let's see some silly Greek horn do that. Of course, Ilmarinen had to retain his composure. After all, he had a wife-to-be to impress. So he kept it cool when he brought the magical item to Lauhi and the Rainbow Maiden. Lauhi was ecstatic. With dizzying speed, she grabbed it from him and hid it in her underground vault, locking it behind nine locks. And satisfied with his job well done, Ilmarinen then turned to the Rainbow Maiden. So, uh, how about this marriage thing? He asked. You ready to head to your new home in the south? But the Rainbow Maiden just shook her head, no. Because, you see, while Lauhi could offer her blessing, it was, in the end, still the Rainbow Maiden's choice whether or not to accept a husband. And if he'd bothered to, oh, I don't know, speak to her at all, he might have learned that she could actually never leave Pahoyoa without causing calamity. The birds would stop singing, the berries would stop growing, mermaids would leave the water, and we all know how bad that would be. So exhausted and defeated, Ilmarinen prepared for the long trek home. But Lauhi wasn't unkind. She offered the failed suitor a boat of copper and bid the north wind to speed him on his journey home. And just like that, Ilmarinen was again at the mercy of the wind, empty-handed, except this time with one sound piece of advice. There was nothing in the world that could be bargained or forged which was more valuable than good old-fashioned communication. And actually, in that very spirit, here's something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. What Nebula actually means to us as creators on the internet. You probably know by now that Nebula is a streaming platform run by all of us creators, but to me it's just more than that. Because we are a small production studio, and it takes a team of writers, producers, animators, editors, and more to turn out new animated videos every week. This, as I'm sure you know, can get rather expensive, <laughs> and you know, a tad worrisome if I'm gonna be honest, because YouTube AdSense revenue fluctuates wildly at times, though historically it does drop in January, yay! And then add in things like our mission to discuss some of the more off-the-beaten-path historical tales that we believe are important to talk about but might not be the most searched for thing and therefore not the most profitable video on YouTube. And I'm not gonna lie, it can get stressful. So I wanted to take a moment here and just thank all of you who have signed up using our link for Nebula, because it's a revenue stream that we can count on even in the leaner months. So that sappy part is why Nebula means a lot to us, but we also do believe that the benefits are mutual. On Nebula, you get to see our extra history videos a full week early, and every single video on Nebula is ad-free because, and get this, we know you're paying for a service, which is a philosophy that some of these double dippers could really learn from. Plus you get access to tons of exclusive originals, including shows about political conflicts around the world by wonderful folks like Real Life Lore and fascinating historical documentaries from powerhouses like Real Time History, Real Engineering, and many more, all of which you can only get on Nebula. It's only $2.50 a month when you sign up using our link for an annual plan, and then a portion of that continues to support us for as long as you are subscribed. Thank you for that. So check out Nebula and support our channel here to help us make more videos like this next one here, which over on Nebula wouldn't have ads. Thanks so much to Michael Hoggett, Kuya Koi, Joseph Lame, Izzy Coin, Dominic Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Angelo Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk. 